All right. I got a little pushback on this statement from last class. Females are better than males. And I think it was a little bit of hyperbole. The reason I said it, though, has to do in some ways with the kind of people that Moran cites all the time. I feel like there's a lot of guys hanging around in cultural ecology. Like he's always citing these guys, and I like guys from like 1977 or something. I feel like he needs to sometimes update things. It's like nobody did any work except for these guys back in the day. So I need to redress that balance a little bit. But that said, I probably went over the top, so I'm going to change it to everybody matters. Okay. Oh, more cozy there. In fact, I'm even going to change it more, which is to say that I think it's not just that there were too many guys in ecology. It's that the biologists in general are so fixated on reproduction. And this kind of goes with Louisa, what we might eventually talk about with hunting. They're so fixated on reproduction that they always are just dividing species into females and males, and they're always only equating sex with something that can be reproductive sex. And so there's a kind of a famous book. I say it's famous because my brother-in-law started talking about it at dinner one time, and he has nothing to do with anthropology or biology, and he was like, oh yeah, it's a great book about evolution. And I'm like, wait a second, the one by Joan Roughgarden? And he's like, yeah, yeah, evolution's rainbow, it's great. I'm like, really? I thought nobody knew that book, but apparently they do. See, even my brother-in-law knew it. Basically, what our author is saying is that because they got so fixated on reproductive sex, they missed all the ways in which many creatures do, do sort of cross gender sex stuff and all the ways in which creatures have sex with other creatures and themselves that are not reproductively oriented. And so I guess when, you know, when people make statements about females and males in a herd, they're often just, again, because of the evolutionary paradigm, get fixated on a very narrow notion of sex. So I'm gonna say that everyone matters and go read Evolution's Rainbow if you haven't already. All right. Got a little bit of pushback on the elephants. Nobody could figure out what the elephants were good for except for stomping on people and stomping on them again at their funeral because they just couldn't get enough of them. So it turns out though, that the elephants are very important. In fact, they're one of our last surviving instances of megafauna. Megafauna is something that we should all get acquainted with. The megafauna, 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 years ago, every continent had a pretty wide variety of megafauna, big animals. And they're hugely important for the ecosystems. There's been some debate with whether it was human beings that wiped them all out and human beings came on the scene, uh, developed better hunting techniques. But the point is that they do interesting things in the environment. And there's a whole movement to bring back the megafauna. Now, admittedly, the Europeans are a little bit strange on this, but they want to bring back the European bison. There used to be bison in Europe and they want to bring them back. And so there's this blog post, it's called Re, from rewildingeurope.com, megafauna restoration is a legal obligation. It almost sounds like a rhyme. They could maybe make a song out of that or something, <laughs> but it's super interesting. Maybe they go too far sometimes when they want to sort of re-engineer some of these mammoths and stuff. I don't know if I'm into that. But the idea of bringing back megafauna is really quite, or, or reintroducing them where they in the ranges where they once were. So some people are really into this. 
you know, I just, I find it pretty interesting in our, we used to have a lot of megafauna around. We don't, you know, things like this. We don't have too many anymore. Got rid of them, but they said they're pretty important for the ecosystems. Ah, I also got some pushback on this never settle idea. I know some people say it's fine. Some people say this is a life lesson, you know, but I think that it's true. I need to reword this a little bit. My rewording is just to say that it's okay to settle. It's okay to settle down if that's what you're into and being settled is fine. But don't stop people from moving around what I'll say, because over the course of human history, we have been a migratory species. That's how people got everywhere. And being able to migrate is very important to, crucial to being, to adapting to different environments, being able to move in and out of them. And so um, I think that with our imposition of borders and controls and all these things, we've We've tried to curtail human migration in ways that is not, not ecologically helpful or helpful to people. So those are my revised lessons, a little less hyperbole. Thanks for the pushback, folks. We'll see what happens to today's lessons. See how much pushback I get. <laughs> Here comes the pushback. A weird question. And I was wondering why you think they do that. All right. Correct. Weird question. Uh, huh? <laughs> Anybody else want to answer it? <laughs> I think it's actually the most accurate place to take a temperature. I'm not sure if it's the warmest, maybe, but it is the most accurate place. So when you have children, if you really want to know what their temperature is, that's where you got to go. I'll just say it's not fun, but sometimes you got to do it. Or if you have livestock. Livestock. Yeah, right. There. Thank you. Yeah. Volunteer studies. Volunteer studies. There you go. Volunteer studies. They sign they all the papers, contradiction papers, and everything. And surely, hopefully, in the same spot where it then degrades. There's there's an interesting article, not about this, but it's close, <laughs> which is that, uh, I mean, we tested people for the coronavirus quite a bit. But nothing like the levels that the Chinese tested people for the coronavirus. I mean, they would go in and test a whole city within days, right? Make everybody do it. But apparently they decided at one point, they're like, oh, we've got these new tests, rectal coronavirus tests. And that was where people drew the line. <laughs> like, that's it. Uh, no way. <laughs> you know, they were fine with everything else, but that was it. So I don't know. Got to watch out for that. All right. The Human Tropics, chapter nine, starting on page 220. Funniest thing happened. Three people quoted from the first sentence. Three whole people quoted the first sentence. They did. I wondered how this, why this would happen. Tyler, why? No, you were the first though. So you were the first. Yeah, I felt like I felt like Moran was playing a little trick on us here, right? He writes this whole book about human ecology, and then he writes all these chapters, and then he talks about the human tropics, and then he finally says rainforest. <laughs> you know, right? usually. That's the first thing you talk about is the rainforest. Now we all have to save the rainforest and the rainforest, man. We've heard about the rainforest all the time. Everybody loves the rainforest. 
because we've had it in all these other lessons and we have to save it. But so he helped us here by sticking it way towards the end. We don't have to read all this other stuff before we finally get to the rainforest. And we don't even realize we're in the rainforest because he calls it the humid tropics. But yeah, then on 220, he tells us we're in the rainforest. Exactly. And Naya, why do you think it was important? I basically studied the setting because you can see how like, it affects us, especially when it gets into the rainforest and what happens over there, and like we have um, California and how it's like not a rainforest, but some farms. You can see how it gets in and it starts to get. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, obviously it's a very important ecosystem and it is one of the most threatened. So I got this from World Wildlife. So, I mean, I guess one of the things that's interesting is sometimes when we hang around up here in this area of the world, around here, I guess, and in places like Massachusetts, like in Massachusetts, they used to do all this farming and then it's sort of been reforested. The forest grew over. So you might get puzzled when we think about in in some places around us, it's like, like the forest is coming back and there's all these rewilding going on. We have eagles swooping around here again and bear and stuff roaming around. Way too many deer, but that's probably because we're too suburban. But um, so, but in this area of the world, there has been some very dramatic changes to the forest area, and it does not seem to be abating. Um, Zeke, you said you were surprised by something here. Yeah, I mean, I think that the human, when they say the human population levels are rel you know, relatively low levels of population, I mean, these, these aren't really urban zones. It's, like I said, especially in South America, they may be playing an outlier role here. I mean, these are more heavily populated zones in through here. But yeah, especially here, not too densely populated. Um, and I think that, you mentioned that one of the reasons I think some of the same lessons from the grasslands and the deserts that work in the rainforest is because some of this land is being turned into grasslands and deserts. So, yeah, this is, uh, it's been a pretty dramatic change. In the Louis, do you have a question? Okay. All right. So, there were a few lessons, I think, that I hope still applied from the grasslands into the, into the rainforest, the uh, humid tropics. Victoria, do you think diversification might still apply? Why? The quote that I said said that for every three trees that they surveyed, one would like to give you a different tree. And then that later, you chapter will pull it down that section and see how um, they don't even know like all the species that are actually there. Like the majority of them, they only have a small percentage that they've actually been able to sample and like get all the information about just in one forested area. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I mean, dealing with an area that's already super diverse and complex. Vicky, you think this still applies here? Why? Yeah, so I think the lesson from diversification still applies. I'm sticking with this one, or differently put in the same way that we were looking out for beware of simply plowing up the forest and planting soybeans there because you're not going to get that 
you're potentially going to lose the existing diversity. So this is, again, I think a lesson that we got from the grasslands, but equally, if not more, applies in the humid tropics. I also like want to stick with diversification because that's what we try to do at Hartwood College. The liberal arts, be diversified. Why are you looking around like that, Liam? We are, we're trying. It's our goal here. Be diversified. Don't just specialize in one thing. In the grasslands, we talked about the technique of fire. <laughs> what do you think, John? Do you think we should keep this technique around? Firework? Uh, in particular, fire, yes, fire can be good if it's under threat and used to help regulate pH levels of food and to recycle materials that we use instead of just throwing it out with buckets of water. All right, so yes, can be actually used to improve the forest here. Yeah, Lou. Actually, well, they text the world's maximum is this part of the book. Um, I guess the text in the lecture. I was looking at like companies in like California and like Oregon, Washington. I will like say they're doing like forest management to keep uh, forest fires at bay, but they actually use it as a way to make profit driving. And basically, they cut down whatever they want for free, like wherever in the forest. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to. I'm sure there's. I'm sure there's better and worse ways to do all these things. Yeah, Tyler. Liam, what do you think? Liam was looking over at Tyler with a bad look. It's pretty in in small areas over time it's a lot more effective than farming and monocropping because it simply requires the environment. The way the way So I guess I would say uh, slash and burn agriculture, also known as swidden or a shifting cultivation, can be, can be good for conservation. Now I'm going to be clear here. It's kind of, now slash and burn actually gets a very bad reputation in part because of the name. Boy, it sounds terrible, doesn't it? Slash and burn, right? And it's kind of like the pastoralists, the herders that have a bad reputation for eating up all the grass. Um, and so, you know, you see this in action and you think, this is crazy. This can't be good for anybody, right? But if you do it controlled and over time and allow the forest to regrow, it can be good. And probably most of what we consider to be is often called virgin forest has actually gone through this process maybe many over many generations. Now, however, both pastoralism and slash and burn agriculture can be overdone. You can try to intensify it. If people are trying to sell stuff, we talked about cash crops and we'll talk about cash crops. If people are trying to speed it up or overproduce it, there are instances in which it totally, Tyler, you're right. It can totally degrade the soil process. So, you know, you have to, it's, you know, it's, it's, like any of these things, there's better and worse ways to do them. And in certain environments, you can learn and you can do this in a way that will make sense. And it's probably the only way that makes sense. But if that's as then harnessed to people who are trying to make money and that's the only way they have to make money and they're burning this stuff 
they've intensified the burning, so it's they're just moving into new areas. Yeah, it can really mess things up too. So, yeah. Uh, I just had a question about, so when I was in high school, I was learning about um, sugar cane, uh, corporations, especially way back when uh, they used slavery. Um, and I, I think, I could be wrong on this, that they used slash and burn, but I don't really remember that well because it's high school. Um, but I was just wondering, are you like familiar with that whole thing about the sugar cane and all that? Sugar cane. Yeah, we did not, we have not talked about the history of, of uh, foods and all those things. But I guess about sugarcane, I would say that, yes, it's probably one of the most environmentally damaging enterprises that has ever been around. It moved more people than any form of cultivation in human history. And uh, how to say, yeah, probably, I mean, you know, but that was not, that was a, a slash and burn in order to establish a plantation, not a, not slash, I mean, when you're doing, Swidden agriculture properly done is a shifting form of agriculture in which you're leaving it. You're not putting up your your plantation for all time. So yeah. Yeah, I was but, thinking of that because I was thinking of the slash and burn thing they did um, right. because they were, like you said, trying to speed up the process as fast as possible to get the most amount of production out of these people. It, it was just a terrible story I read, but. Yeah, that's a whole another subject, and I'm sorry if I caused any inconvenience. No, no, that I mean, that's the thing. Like I said, there's two forms of slash and burn. There's the one that's like either sped up or to make it a permanent transformation of the land, but there's the other ones that's basically, basically properly done, as Moran says. Slash and burn actually mimics the forest, so you slash and burn it, you plant certain things that are going to grow first, providing cover for the next round of crops, and then you move 10 years later into a different plot, and that plot starts to actually look like forest again. So, yeah. Anyway, we'll keep this lesson. Still applies. Oh, Louisa, good. You're on. Learn before you plant. Do you think that applies to the rainforest? Yes. <laughs> I guess my comment is like, what was, you know, what was the, their, their findings in the past were saying that the soils in the rainforest were no good? Um, because I feel like I didn't really see anything about the past research in there. So that's, what, that's why I was a little confused on where those claims came from, um, especially because in our own uh, society today, we see a lot of the fruit, produce, and, and things like that, especially like avocados, that's farther down in South America, obviously, for some reason. But uh, we see a lot of produce coming from South America and Central America, so I don't understand where that thing came from in the first place. That's what I was kind of like going on about. And then I also thought it was really interesting, the amount of leaves that are dropped by the rainforest, like six to eight tons. That's a lot, especially seeing that um, leaves are really light. You know? Well, it's six to eight tons per hectare. And a hectare is a pretty decent size of land, you have to remember. It's not just your backyard. Well, maybe your backyard is a hectare. Mine is not a hectare. A hectare is a, you know, it's a few acres of land. So um, it's a, you know, yeah, it's a lot of leaves that come down and they're, you know, <laughs> humid. They're not dry like the autumn leaves. They're like the humid rainforest leaves dropping down like all the time. Yeah, and then those leaves create nutrients for the soil and for the, the trees in the surrounding area, right? Correct. And if we understand that and don't impose some other weird agricultural system like plantations, sugar cane, then we'll be in better shape. So absolutely apply. Modern history. Autumn, does this apply to us in the rainforest? Why? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, the Amazon is one of those interesting places that a lot of people say that, in fact, the peoples who became indigenous to the Amazon have transformed the whole place. Like I said, a lot of places that we qualify as so-called virgin lands have been places that have been worked and reworked over generations. And they're, you know, they've been adaptable and adapting as well. But certainly learning from those ideas is crucial to going forward. Lesson still applies. Beware excessive market orientation was one of my lessons from the grasslands. And for me, I think it applies to the cattle in the Amazon and where we get our beef from, which it turns out, we probably learn about this in other classes, but just to reiterate that in Latin America, the most common form of land use in the tropical rainforest regions today is cattle ranching. And this activity has been held responsible for up to 90% of deforestation in Brazil. So, you know, probably not the best for this area, especially, as I said, if they're oriented toward the market. Use everything. Lesson still applies, right, Cass? What else can we use? Insects. We should all be eating insects, in fact. The insects. It turns out it does sound good. That's had a lot of questions about these insects. I'm going to tell you all about that in a second. Mm -hmm. I got really into this. You know, it turns out there's a couple of anthropologists who have gotten really into insects. There's an anthropologist named Hugh Raffles who wrote a book called Insectopedia. And uh, I remember reading an interview with him and he said, you know, we'd, we'd have much more respect for the insects if we could look at them on their scale and like blow them up to life. So I tried looking at them. I didn't have a huge respect for them. But they're kind of like, you know, we're talking about megafauna. If you get down really little, they're like the megafauna of their own world. They're roaming around there. They're pretty, pretty interesting. Um, they are also very interesting in human evolution. Many people all over the world eat insects and have been for years. And it's not necessarily because they don't have anything else. Some people just like them. A lot of people believe that we're going to need insects again in all parts of the world to be able to keep on surviving. So, in fact, I found that the, back a little while ago, the UN urges eating insects. Maybe that's why nobody pays attention to them. Eight popular bugs to try. So I was about to click on the bugs, but then it made me want to register for the website. So then I found another one that gave me the 10 best edible insects we dare you to try. I think that was in the farmer's almanac. So, Louis. <laughs> oh, yeah, somebody gave me one of those. No, not yet. I would start there. They see like a nice little, like, pretty game and then get those scorpions. Well, I. I... <laughs> there you go it's you know some of them are just coming in they're going to start using cricket flour as protein and stuff and you won't even oh, know it do. probably already do probably part of it the 10 ones crickets yeah there you go crickets there's a lot of them though yeah cicadas cicadas also called the shrimp of the land uh, uh, there's a lot of parallels between eating shrimp and eating insects, and there's a lot of crossovers. Between. Anybody who eats shrimp should be able to eat insects. Like if you can eat those those things, Lobster you can you can eat too. insects. Yeah, Lobster. right. Exactly. Mealworms, scorpions. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, scorpions have been likened to the taste of soft shell crab. Wow. Last class, we're going to get some deep fried cicada poppers with some like spicy sauce. Yeah. June bugs, grasshoppers. 
Which reminds me, wasn't John the Baptist eating locusts and wild honey? Isn't that true? Don't you know the Bible? Isn't that what they say in the Bible? John the Baptist comes in from the desert. Isn't that something? Psychedelic honey. It's pretty cool. When I was growing up in Montana, my parents were part of this religious denomination, which we did not do Halloween because that was bad. So then we did a dress up as biblical characters. And I do remember dressing up as John the Baptist and dipping a grasshopper in wild honey. I mean, just honey, and trying it out. Wasn't my best moment. Ants. Ants, apparently, you can use as a crunchy topping. They taste kind of vinegary. Do fire ants, like, are they biting anything? Don't know about that. Wax worms. Apparently, wax worms have a pretty fatty content. They're, they're kind of less protein, more fat. Tastes kind of like pine nuts. I don't know what the definition is. All right, crucial here, forest termites. For those of you who were with me in anthropology, maybe two generations ago, two or three semesters ago, when we read a Lavenda and Schultz textbook, you may realize that it began with them eating forest, the flying termites. I put in here, not house termites. Don't just try this with the ones that are eating your parents' house. Those aren't good. You have to get them in the forest, not your house, unfortunately. And pill bugs, which apparently are better than shrimp. <laughs> That's what they say. Actually, it was somebody back in 1896 or something who said they were as tasty as shrimp, maybe even better. in your food. So um, we are all eating bugs. We're already eating. Yeah. <laughs> it's already happened. What's... Especially peanut. Oh. Hmm. There you go. We need to have the spokesperson and talk about how well, they are. There we go. The insects are coming in. They're going to be great. I think I'd just rather eat them straight up. I don't want them smuggled into my chocolate. <laughs> if I'm going to eat them, I want to eat them. I want to know. I want to do it the right way. All right, as fun as that was, Jacob, tell us about hunting. <laughs> yeah, and you, it, it, seems, it seems weirder now that you're talking about it than when you wrote about it. <laughs> this is, was, was among a, I think uh, among the Tuganoan people, Colombia? No, the Tucano. The verb to hunt is Vimera gamma terrari. Which sounds great until you know what it literally means. <laughs> hmm. 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 Going on nice barbecue and doing a little bit of uh, hunting in the supermarket. What if you're an insect? Well, the hunting man. You might, you might like the insects better after this little round of. 
All right, I talked about this in the Arctic, actually, if you remember. It sounded better, though, when I talked about it, I think. With the caribou looking them in the eye and that hunting was essentially a nonviolent act linked with regeneration and reproduction. But, you know, the thing is, is when you get linked with regeneration and reproduction, then it can have this other thing going on, too, which everybody regrets talking about. Um, I guess I'll say that in terms of literally, <laughs> we just have to be very careful with the word literally. And I think it's more like, I guess I would say more like spiritually, like it's the stuff of dreams and and literature more than, than you know, the kinds of, uh, you know, this is not something that literally happens. And I think that people have almost throughout human history, if we look back at all those ceramics of, you know, unions between mystical creatures and humans and all the weird things, they're not necessarily depicting an actual thing as much as they are a character of the beautiful human imagination which can do all these things so i don't think this is actually the same as literally <laughs> doing it but it's a metaphorical use which can be pretty interesting but and also maybe worth looking more into or not let's talk about fishing instead <laughs> Liz. now it's fishing hmm. even though this is I got this site see there's those two guys again seemed like nice guys but they're the ones who were talking about fishing anyway Liz what's the deal with the fishing Yeah, that's just super interesting. I think I was told that if you're ever starving, it would be harder to fish than it would be the calories you got out of it. But apparently they're the opposite. They can actually get these fish and use them. So, yeah, I mean, I think that it just is another way in which people are adapting to their environments in different ways than we might, we might think. All right. Anna, you've been tracking clothing all the way through. As a cultural adaptation to all these areas, you have often commented on the clothing. What do we have as a way of adapting to the humid tropics in terms of clothing? Minimal clothing, yeah, don't need it. Gotta not have clothing. So that was interesting. Minimal. And housing. We also talked about this. Yeah. Yeah, there's just, there's, there's only one problem with this. You have your open design for daytime cooling and your closed design for nighttime warmth. And if you read the next sentence, it tells you that in fact, you either get to do one or the other. I haven't solved this yet. Are you either with people who like it open? It's nicer during the daytime and there's the people that like it closed. So it's nicer in the night. 
But this is, there's only, you can only choose one or the other. You got to go with one. I know. <laughs> I don't know. Moran says he can't. He says there's no perfect solution. See, right there. He said no perfect solution. The problem, <laughs> I, you know, I'm just, he says it twice. He says it on page 236. No perfect solution for housing is available. That is very definitive. That is a very definitive sentence right there. I mean, I think, yeah, you all think you can solve this, but if the indigenous people can't solve it, I don't think you can either. Air conditioning. At no <laughs> all right, you people who think you can solve this thing, Mickey. Doesn't look like it, does it? <laughs> I mean, I actually think, you know, I was thinking about the mosquitoes. I, I mean, the problems with mosquitoes are often around, um, more around like agricultural wetlands where they are associated with malaria. I'm not sure if they have the same issues, but I'm not, I don't, I don't know about that. Yeah, Louis. You say in Japan, like I learned about this because there is no Japanese powder that has like really thin walls and like they have made out of rice paper for this exact reason so that it's tempered during the day and can be like collapsed. And then at night it's more, you can have, they have like the way they design their houses are actually built around like the way the temperature flows around the house during the day. Well, I'm sure it's great in Japan. But Moran says that there is no perfect solution for housing is available. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure if the Japanese had found it, we'd all be using it. Houses are characterized either by open design or by designs aimed at the conservation of heat. Minimal use of clothing, blah, blah. I don't know. Maybe we'll, Maybe something will be figured out. For now, I got to stick with the textbook, man. No perfect solution. <laughs> right. It's very definitive. It makes you want to find a solution.